Computers are able to communicate across massive distances at near instant speeds. It's a remarkable technical advancement at the root of how billions of people use the internet every single day. Hold up. Let's Earlier in this course, we learned about how computers communicate with each other over short distances or on a single network segment or LAN. In these next lessons, we'll focus on the technologies that allow data to cross many networks, facilitating communications over great distances. By the end of this module, you'll be able to describe the IP addressing scheme and how subnetting works. This means you'll learn how to perform basic math in binary in order to describe subnets. You'll also be able to demonstrate how encapsulation works and how protocols such as ARP allow different layers of the network to communicate. And finally, you'll gain an understanding of the basics behind routing, routing protocols, and how the internet works. For now, route yourself to the next video and we'll get started. Okay. On a local area network or LAN, Nodes can communicate with each other through their physical MAC addresses. This works well on small scale because switches can quickly learn the MAC addresses connected to each other ports to forward transmissions appropriately. But MAC addressing isn't a scheme that scales well. Every single network interface on the planet has a unique MAC address, and they aren't ordered in any sort of systematic way. There's no way of knowing where on the planet a certain MAC address might be at any one point in time so it's not ideal for communicating across distances. Later on in this lesson, when we introduce ARP or address resolution protocol, you'll see that the way that nodes learn about each other's physical addressing isn't translatable to anything besides a single network segment anyway. Clearly, we need another solution. And that is the network layer and the internet protocol or IP and the IP addresses that come along with it. By the end of this lesson, you'll be able to identify an IP address, describe how IP datagrams are encapsulated inside the payload of an Ethernet frame, and correctly identify and describe the many fields of an IP datagram header. Okay. IP addresses are 32-bit long numbers made up of four octets, and each octet is normally described in decimal numbers. Eight bits of data, or a single octet, can represent all decimal numbers from 0 to 255. For example, 12.34.56.78 is a valid IP address, but 123.456.789.100 would not be because it has numbers larger than could be represented by 8 bits. This format is known as dotted decimal notation. We'll deep dive into how some of this works in an upcoming lesson about subnetting. The important thing to know for now is that IP addresses are distributed in large sections to various organizations and companies instead of being determined by hardware vendors. This means that IP addresses are more hierarchical and easier to store data about than physical addresses are. Think of IBM, which owns every single IP that has the number 9 as the first octet. At a very high level, this means that if an internet router needs to figure out where to send a data packet intended for the IP address 9.0.0.1, that router only has to know to get it to one of IBM's routers. That router can handle the rest of the delivery process from there. It's important to call out that IP addresses belong to the networks, not the devices that
attached to those networks. So your laptop will always have the same MAC address no matter where you use it, but it'll have a different IP address assigned to it at an internet cafe than it would when you're at home. The LAN at the internet cafe or the LAN at your house would each be individually responsible for handing out an IP address to your laptop if you power it on there. On a day-to-day -day basis, getting an IP address is usually a pretty invisible process. You'll learn more about some of the technologies at play in a later lesson. For now, remember that on many modern networks, you can connect a new device and an IP address will be assigned to it automatically through a technology known as Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. An IP address assigned this way is known as a dynamic IP address. The opposite of this is dynamic or assigned automatically. Is known as a static IP address, sure. which must be configured on a no static IP address. IP address. IP address assigned this way is known as a configuration protocol. An IP address assigned this way is known as a dynamic IP address. The opposite of this is known as a static IP address, which must be configured on a node manually. In most cases, static IP addresses are reserved for servers and network devices, Shoot. while dynamic IP addresses. are reserved for clients. But there are certainly situations where this might not be true. Just like how the data packets at the ethernet layer have a specific name, ethernet frames, so do packets at the network layer. Under the IP protocol, a packet is usually referred to as an IP datagram. Just like any ethernet frame, an IP datagram is a highly structured series of fields that are strictly defined. The two primary Man. Datagram is a highly structured series of fields that are strictly defined. The two primary sections of an IP datagram are the header and the payload. All right, screenshot. It is when it is Alt Tab. No, Control Tab. Shift Tab. 
screenshot on Windows 10. Here's a summary from PC Mac. How to take a screenshot Shift on Windows S. 10. Oops. Get rid of. What? Oh, Windows key shift and X. It's been put. Put it down most. You'll notice that an IP datagram header contains a lot more data than an Ethernet frame header does. The very first field is 4 bits and indicates what version of internet protocol is being used. The most common version of IP is version 4, or Today I'm studying. I apologize, but today I'm studying. I won't be uh, showing anything. IPv4. Version 6, or IPv6, is rapidly seeing more widespread adoption. After the version field, we have the header length field. This is also a 4-bit field that declares how long the entire header is. This is almost always 20 bytes in length when dealing with IPv4. In fact, 20 bytes is the minimum length of an IP header. You couldn't fit all the data you need for a properly formatted IP header in any less space. Next, we have the service type field. These 8 bits can be used to specify details about quality. What up, leftovers? Much better. Today I'm in a much better mood. Thank you for asking. 
I'm even feeling like I can absorb information better. Yesterday was just a bad day. I super apologize about it. Uh, I didn't mean to put it on you guys. Thank you. Thank you all for being there for me. Quality of service or QoS technologies. What up, the Jack? The important takeaway about QoS is that there are services. You guys want to see how good I really did feel? You should check out my workout from earlier. Son, I was trying to kill my, my chest. <laughs> trying my best. <laughs> ...that allow routers to make decisions about which IP datagram may be more important than others. The next field is a 16-bit field known as the total length field. It's used for exactly what it sounds like. <laughs> Again, HML. Today I will be studying. I will not be showing off anything but my face. Um, I'm in the process of trying to switch careers and I have to get a move on. I have enough money to last for about the next three weeks and it's going to be a month and a half before I can be done with this and looking for a job. So I have to get a, a roll on. I have to get the ball on the roll, not a roll on. I will be reserving that for weekends only. If you're interested, drop back by this Saturday. To indicate the total length of the IP datagram it's attached to. The identification field is a 16-bit number that's used to group messages together. IP datagrams have a that's used to group messages together. IP datagrams have a maximum size, and you might already be able to figure out what that is. Since the total length field is 16 bits, and this field indicates the size of an individual datagram, the maximum size of a single datagram is the largest number you can represent with 16 bits. Shoot, that almost didn't work. Sixty-five thousand five hundred and thirty-five. What? Jack, you still here? Why is that number important? Is that as far as 16 bits can go?
Yes. So two to the power of sixteen is okay. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Jack. If the total amount of data that <laughs> that needs to be sent is larger than what can fit in a single datagram, the IP layer needs to split this data up into many individual packets. When this happens, the identification field is used so that the receiving end understands that every packet with the same value in that field is part of the same transmission. Next up, we have two closely related fields, the flag field and the fragmentation offset field. The flag field is used to. These six minute long videos, I already know I'm going to be writing a crap ton. On this part, the networking, every few seconds I got to pause and write. <laughs> <laughs> I feel you there, bro. This networking stuff is a lot. But I feel like I'm probably absorbing better today. So we'll see. to indicate if a datagram is allowed to be fragmented or to indicate that the datagram has Thank already you, been fragmented. Fragmentation is the process of taking... And let me tell you what caused it too. Last night's gaming with you and then I spent probably till one o'clock in the morning coddling with the girlfriend after we got off. Well, about an hour after we got off. And that's what elevated my mood. 
this morning she acted completely different than yesterday from just that one night last night. It really, it really helped. Which made me feel better in exchange. I like it when I can make people happy. Give me just a second, guys. I got hit back from, uh, I got a graphics card for sale right now at 9 at 950 for 40 bucks. Somebody just hit me up. On top of. Looks like I just sold a little baby graphics card. Selling. So this is what I'm selling. It's a little baby graphics card. It's a little uh, 950. It's what came out of the blue computer we were discussing yesterday about the upgrading. This was the original graphics card in it, this little 950. I pulled it out and slapped a 980 in it. It's still in good condition. It just wasn't big enough to support Destiny, and that was the game I was playing at the time, so I had to upgrade. Ah, uh, back when GPUs weren't dumbbells. <laughs> yes, back when GPUs were not dumbbells. <laughs> it's still fairly large. It's uh, it's probably about an inch and a half too from being like maximum size for normal towers. But it's not nowhere near as heavy as the 3060 Ti I got. That thing probably weighs four times what this little 950 weighs. 
All right, let's write this down and then move on. That's good news, man. I'm gonna make I'm gonna make money possibly twice today. I got him dropping by. He said he'll have transportation around three or four, which means it'll probably be about five before he gets to me with traffic. I don't live exactly in Nashville. And there's no telling exactly where he's coming from as well. Nashville's huge. Oh, I screwed that word up. Signal. IP. Data. Gram. And. Splitting. Before I forget, I'm paranoid, so I'm going to go grab my gun real quick. Give me just one second, guys. Yeah, I know. It, I'm just more. They encourage people to do it at their stations. Uh, so I'm I'm an ex-criminal. I don't I don't like cops at all. <laughs> I've got 17 arrests. I don't like cops. So I'd just rather take care of things myself. I got a few guns here. I just keep one on me. If anything happens, I just kill him. Turns out, self-defense does not cover murder, but it does when the guy has a weapon. Subdue him, yes. Subdue, not kill. Subdue. Plus, when people see me in all of my size, right in front of their face, they have a tendency to not be what they thought they were going to be. <laughs> I'm a lot to handle in general. Imagine this five foot nine, 170 uh, pound man in your face. Really excitable. <laughs> man, I grew up in Crossville. I'm pretty good at hiding bodies. <laughs> I've got plenty of information throughout all the people I've run into that gives me all kinds of means to hide a body. It doesn't mean I've done done that yet, but I know how. But I, I appreciate the offer. Being a single IP datagram and splitting it up into several For smaller sure, datagrams. For sure, but not six foot. While most networks Let's operate go six with stories. similar settings in terms of what size an IP datagram is allowed to be, sometimes this could be configured differently. If a datagram has to cross from a network allowing a larger datagram size to one with a smaller datagram size, the datagram would have to be fragmented into smaller ones. The fragmentation offset field contains values used by the receiving end to take all the parts of a fragmented packet and put them back together in the correct order. Let's move along to the time to live or TTL field. This field is an 8-bit. All right.
field that indicates how many router hops a datagram can traverse before it's thrown away. Every time a datagram reaches a new router, that router decrements the TTL field by one. Once this value reaches zero, a router knows it doesn't have to forward the datagram any further. The main The purpose of this field is to make sure that when there's a misconfiguration in routing that causes an endless loop, datagrams don't spend all eternity trying to reach their destination. An endless loop could be when router A thinks router B is the next hop, and router B thinks router A is the next hop. After the TTL field, you'll find the protocol field. This is another 8-bit field that contains data about what transport layer protocol is being used. The most common transport layer protocols are TCP and UDP. So most common protocol. Wait. About what transport layer protocol is being used. The most common transport layer protocols are TCP and UDP. So next, we find the header checksum field. This field is a checksum of the contents of the entire Your IP datagram header. It functions very much like the Ethernet checksum field. Field 
we discussed in the last module. Since the TTL field has to be recomputed at every router that a datagram touches, the checksum field necessarily changes too. After all of that, we finally get to two very important fields, the source and destination IP address fields. Remember that an IP address is a 32-bit number, so it should come as no surprise that these fields are each 32 bits long. Up next, we have the IP options field. This is an op We finally get to two very important fields, the source and destination IP address fields. Remember that an IP address is a 32-bit number, so it should come as no surprise that these fields are each 32 bits long. Up next, we have... the IP options field. This is an optional field and is used to set special special characteristics for datagrams primarily used for testing purposes. The IP options field is usually followed by a padding field. Since the IP options field is both optional and variable in length, the padding field
is the It's just a series of zeros used to ensure the header is the correct total size. Now that you know about all of the parts of an IP datagram, you might wonder how this relates to what we've learned so far. You might remember that in our breakdown of an Ethernet frame, we mentioned a section we described as the data payload section. This is exactly what the IP datagram is. And this so far. You might remember that in our breakdown of an Ethernet frame, we mentioned a section we described as the data payload section. This is exactly what the IP datagram is. And this process is known as encapsulation. The entire contents of an IP datagram are encapsulated the as the payload as of an Ethernet frame. Of an IP datagram, you might wonder how this relates to what we've learned so far. You might remember that in our breakdown of an Ethernet frame, we mentioned a section we described as the data payload section. This is exactly what the IP datagram is. And this process is known as encapsulation. The entire contents of an IP datagram are encapsulated as the payload of an Ethernet frame. You might have picked up on the fact that our IP datagram also has a payload section. The contents of this payload are the entirety of a TCP or UDP packet. Hopefully, this helps you better understand why we talk about networking in terms of layers. Each layer is needed for the one above it. Hold up, hold up, hold up. Why we talk about networking in terms of layers, payload, are the entirety of a TCP or UDP packet. Hopefully, this helps you better understand why we talk about networking in terms of layers. Each layer is needed for the one above it. Shoo, that was a lot of talking. They should have put that on the screen, bro. IP addresses can be split into two sections. The network IP... Son of a gun, starting it off. <laughs> yeah, it just hit me straight off the rip with something to write down. Oh, finally they gave me a little thing. I thought about writing them and telling them that it would probably be, be more beneficial if they were to do those little tests more frequently. ID and the host ID. Earlier, we mentioned that IBM owns all IP addresses that have a 9 as the value of the first octet in an IP address. If we take an example IP address of 9.100.100.100, the network ID would be the first octet, and the host ID would be the second, third, and And fourth octets. The address class system Hey Hex <laughs> 
That's why I'm writing it down, bro. <laughs> <laughs> oh hex i think i forgot to tell you jack fixed me up yesterday me and jack got together and he did a lot of research and i'm back on my old world so jack hooked me up is a way of defining how the global ip address space is split up there are three primary types of address classes Class A, Class B, and... I wonder if the next one's going to be Class C. What are you stressed for, leftovers? <laughs> and class C. Class <laughs> Oh no, bro. That sucks, man. <laughs> All right, let's see what this is going to say first. A addresses are those where the first octet is used for the network ID. and the last three are used for the host. Class B addresses are where the first two octets are used for the network ID and this. Let's go back just a hair. addresses lol <laughs> all cookies are magic cookies <laughs> Two are host for the network ID, and the second two are you. Use for the host ID. Class C addresses, as you might have guessed, are those where the first three octet. Oh. I ain't got no cookies, but I got some gummies if you're looking for a, a magic type of food. <laughs> Come on over. Pay me a visit. I'll hook you up. <laughs>
I'm sorry to hear that, Leftovers. Hex, whenever you're ready to come pay me a visit, I have lots of plans for you, including trying some gummies. I like to dabble in some high-grade ones, though, because my tolerance is a little high. It's the only thing out there I consider not to be a drug. It's more of a, uh, it's not a, it's not a stimulant, it's a relaxant. <laughs> so, uh, I've got, I've got, I'm a die. <laughs> I've got some 150s right now. Uh, I'm, I'm known to dabble in the 420s and the 350s. Uh, but one of my most favorite ones is this, uh, brownie we got one. Well, it wasn't really a brownie, it was like cereal. But uh, we got that one time, cost like 40 bucks for a bar, and we didn't bother to read it, and just broke it in half and devoured it. And after I read it, I realized there was uh, 3,000 in it, and you were supposed to take a small bite. Needless to say, the next full day, I felt like it was still in my system. <laughs> but I did 1,500. Well, it was, it was from the same place I normally get the other ones from, and I've never found one higher than 420, so I was like, all right, cool, we'll be all right. It's just a, it's just a bar. <laughs> nope. Not only did I forget I was even watching TV and passed out, but when I woke up the next day, like the whole day, it affected me. <laughs> I will, I will not make that mistake again. I will, from now on, read what I am consuming. Well, in in Delta Eight, with food, if it looks tasty, I'll probably eat it. If you ever want to kill me, that's the fastest way to do it. Just poison my food. You put it in my face, I'll probably eat it. I like eating stuff. <laughs> I just sniff it and be screwed. Maybe, maybe. Sometimes whenever I get some of the gummies, it I don't know if you've well you've never even smoked weed. Uh, sometimes when I get them, uh, it tastes like stems. And what I mean by that is whenever I was uh, selling pot, uh, whenever you know I'd, I'd break it up and roll with them and stuff, I'd chew on the stems. And the taste that the stem used to give me is the same taste I taste when I chew gummies. It tastes like it's made out of the stem. Which is fine. I mean, I don't really care about the taste. It goes away after about two hours. ...are used for the network ID, and only the final octet is used for the host ID. Each address class represents a network of vastly different size. Dang it, man. Class represents a network that vastly different in size. One, two, three, four. Six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Class A, B, C, D, E. There's a class E. Leftmost bits. Zero X X X ten X X one one zero X one 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 zero one 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 zero one 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 starting I P address zero point zero point zero point zero. This is going to be hard. Last IP address. I wonder if I just goofed it. Hey, I figured out a cheat code. 127, 
255. 255 all the way through. So 192. Nope, not one. One, two, two, three. Ooh, that's ammo. Two, three, nine. It's one of my favorite types of ammo. Two, two, three is a AR-15. Also AR-15s, or not AR-15s, uh, assault rifles. Son of a gun. AKs. But they can take 223 as well as 556. Five, I like 556, five, but it's for the M the M models. The fully assault rifle. Full assault rifle. Of driver types. <laughs> I have found out something interesting about license. Uh, anything you register. If you ever Google the word register, it means to uh, relinquish. So when you register something, you're giving it away. A little bit of neat information I found. So when you register a car, you're giving it to the government. When you register a gun, you're giving it to the government. You're giving it straight to the government. Interesting way around stuff, make it mandatory. For example, since a Class A network has a total of 24 bits of host ID space, this comes out to 2 to the 24th, or 16,777,216 individual addresses. Shoot. Compare this with a Class Not C network, really. which only has 8 bits of host ID space. For a Class C network, this comes out to 2 to the 8th, or 256 addresses. You can also tell exactly what address class an IP address belongs to just by looking at it. If the very first bit of an IP address is 0, it belongs to a Class A network. If the first bits are 1, 0, it belongs to a Class B network. Finally, if the first bits are 1, 1, 0, it belongs to a Class C network. Since humans aren't great at thinking in binary, it's good to know that this also translates nicely to how these addresses are represented in dotted decimal notation. You might remember that each octet in an IP address is 8 bits, which means each octet can take a value between 0 and 255. If the first bit has to be a 0, as it is with the class A address, the possible values for the first octet are 0 through 127. This means that any IP address with a first octet with one of those values is a class A address. Similarly, class B addresses are restricted to those that begin with the first octet value of 128 through 191, and class C addresses begin with the first octet value of 192 through 223. You might notice that this doesn't cover every possible IP address. That's because there are two other IP address classes but they're not quite as important to understand. Class D addresses always begin with the bits 1110 and are used for multicasting, which is how a single IP datagram can be sent to an entire network at once. These addresses begin with decimal values between 224 and 239. Lastly, Class C addresses make up all of the remaining IP addresses, but they're unassigned and only used for testing purposes. In practical terms, That's two two two. Dang it, I just gave them credit and it's not even a test. It's them saying, oops, we screwed up. So it is So what I wrote down was ending in two two three. Whatever. I'll figure it out later. This class system has mostly been replaced by a system known as CIDR, 
or classless inner domain routing. But the address class system is been replaced. Is that what it said? Been replaced? Class system has mostly been replaced by a system known as CIDR. or classless inner domain routing. Classless inner domain routing. But the address class system is still in place in many ways and is important to understand for anyone looking for a well-rounded networking education. And you know we're all about that. Oh, boy. Congrats. You now understand how both MAC addresses are used at the data link layer and how IP addresses are used at the network layer. Now we need to discuss how these two separate address types relate to each other. Oh, this is where start. Address Resolution Protocol, or ARP, comes into play. Is it sad as soon as I heard ARP, I thought AARP? Does that make me old? Or is that my sign I'm getting old? <laughs> is a protocol used to discover the hardware address of a node with a certain IP address. <laughs> Once an IP datagram has been fully formed, it needs to be encapsulated inside an Ethernet frame. This means that the transmitting device needs a destination MAC address to complete the Ethernet frame header. Almost all network connected devices will retain a local ARP table. An ARP table is just a list of IP All local devices will contain what? Contain a local ARP table. Will contain a local ARP table. ARP table. A list. What does that say about me then? 
<laughs> Hex, aren't you younger than me? Doesn't that make me older? Shouldn't I feel worse about it? Yeah, aren't you like 35 or something? No. You're a couple years older than me. You're like 39? An ARP table is Sorry, just a list of IP addresses feelings. and the MAC addresses associated with them. Let's say we want to... Bro, I feel so stupid now. Yes, you're the seven. Five years ain't bad. Send some data to the IP address 10.20. Let's say we want to send some data to the IP address 10.20.30.40. It might be the case that this destination doesn't have an entry in the ARP table. When this happens, <laughs> LDD is trying to get a hold of me on Summoner's War because I'm playing in the background. I told him to come to the channel. Oh. Jack, that looks pretty cool, man. I'll check into that in just a minute. Dang it. Just made my phone purple. Oh, no. 10.20.30.40. It might be the case that this destination doesn't have an entry in the ARP table. When it's not very fun. How students are changing what? The STEAM, right? Students who grew up with search engines might change STEM. I, I read STEAM. I read STEAM. Well, it could st still be beneficial, man. I mean, who's to say, feel that. <laughs> who's to say that your education won't land you a high-paying job? Just find what you're passionate about and just follow that, man. Don't let, don't let nobody tell you what to do. Because in the end, your level of passion determines how much you can actually learn and how far you can actually go. So if you don't have any passion, you won't go anywhere. If you've got a lot of passion, you'll go places. When this happens, the node that wants to send data sends a broadcast ARP message to the MAC broadcast address, which is all S. These kinds of broadcast ARP messages are delivered to all computers on the local network. When the network interface that's been assigned an IP of 10.20.30.40 receives this ARP broadcast, it sends back what's known as an ARP response. This response message will contain the MAC address for the network interface in question. Now, the transmitting computer knows what MAC address to put in the destination hardware address field, and the Ethernet frame is ready for delivery. It'll also likely store this IP address in its local ARP table so that it won't have to send an ARP broadcast the next time it needs to communicate with this IP. Handy. ARP table entries generally expire after Now I'm uncomfortable. Art table entry. Can have up. Expire.
article from late 2021, but the concept of file folders and directories is essential to previous generations understanding of computers is gibberish to many modern students. Oh, because they're using the, uh, what was that layer called? The GUI layer. So they're all accustomed to the GUI layer, the actual application. They don't, they, they don't understand all the, the necessities. Is that what you're saying? Essentials to previous generations, understanding of computers, the concept of file folders and directories. Yeah, I learned, I learned all that in the past. It's file folders and directories, previous generations. 7 Ultimate was my favorite until 10. And even 10 I had to work into. I didn't really like it. And understanding computers. Or do you mean they don't know how to build one, but they know how to work one? You might need to clarify this a little bit more. <laughs> that, that rose more questions than gave answers. They don't know how to find a file. Well, you just search it. You check the... Now, sometimes getting to the specific file destination is kind of complicated. Like, I don't know why they split up uh, the, the file manager uh, with the uh, local directory. I, uh, I, don't, I don't know why they split it up. Used to, you could find it all in one. Like, you could find your hard drives and everything. But uh, aside from that, no. Nothing... They can't make a, I can make a file on. Dude, I can make a file in just a few seconds. Yeah, what heck said. <laughs> I don't have a five-year-old, but if I had one, he'd know how to do. He or she. I'll probably have a girl first, knowing my luck. I'll be tormented with her. So I got to kill everybody first. For a short amount of time to ensure changes in the network are... Oh, I didn't finish writing that down. I got distracted. Go figure, somebody with ADHD got distracted. No way. Oh, that's an A. Uh, shoot. I wasn't going to say anything. <laughs> I like that one, Jack. <laughs> well, in, in in Hex's, uh, well, praise, in Hex's praise, she works with computers every day at home. So her, her kids would have to learn how to, how to operate them eventually. <laughs> Accounted for. Looking up IP addresses. Let's read this. I seen law enforcement and I immediately got interested. A lot of people worry that their IP address might reveal their name, home address, age, what they look like online, and more. That's just not the case. Sure, they might find out something, some interesting information, but nothing revealing. Uh, I'm gonna call BS. Let's explore what you can discover by running a real IP address through an IP lookup website like this one. Well. No, it's legitimately wrong. I don't live in Murfreesboro, which, by the way, I figured out that's pronounced Murfreesboro, thanks to GPS. <laughs> Jesus at the pop-ups, bro. I don't want to update my IP address, my location, because then it'll know exactly where I'm at. But I can tell you. Oh my god. 
I don't go by the GPS. <laughs> but there is an S in it. <laughs> Murfreesboro. But if you're from Tennessee, it's Murfreesboro. Murfreesboro. There's no R at all. Murfreesboro. Just like everybody native to Nashville. We don't call it Nashville. We call it Crashville. Heading down 24 is such a dangerous thing to do. These are a handful of practical reasons people use IP lookup, even with its limitations. Law enforcement and fraud investigators use online tools to see what ISP is hosting as spammer. Blacklisted databases used to find spammers or other violators and block their access to email servers. I didn't know there was a blacklist database. Retailers often use an IP lookup to make sure someone charging thousands of dollars is at the mailing address linked to the card and not actually overseas with the stolen credit. Huh. So, if that's what's going on, law enforcement can't do all that nonsense. And how come every time I go to jail, I get a note on my phone saying that law enforcement got in it and searched through all my information and where I've been? They can't find that unless they've got my IP right and everywhere that's gone to it. I always have a little sticky note saying law enforcement has been through my personal belongings. Yeah, that's what I thought. After about arrest four, they just started doing it. I got to the point where I'd either break my phone or chuck it before I got arrested. Because I had some sensitive data on there. I didn't want to out anybody else. Oh yeah, I forgot to do this. yours you didn't put anything all right time for a practice quiz let's see if I learned anything my father was a cop I have a relative in Ohio that conveniently enough named my name with a K at the end uh, that's a uh, law enforcement in uh, I think it's Troy I think he retired from Dade, uh, Dayton and went to Troy but no, all my information doesn't come from him um, my information comes from my record uh, my actions as an adolescent and uh, a young adult, I guess. I don't know. I was acting pretty childish. I was robbing everybody. IP addresses does a Class C network have? Dang it. I didn't write that down. It's 2 to the 8th power. I think it's this one. No. What's 2 to the 8th power? 2 to the power of 8 is 256. Well, that doesn't help. I don't think it's that small one. Wait a minute. It's not 256. It's not one. I think it's this one. If 
that's right, I'm going to write it down. Class B. The blank is used to indicate that the datagram is allowed to be fragmented or is initiated, indicated that the datagram has already been fragmented. It's the flag field, right? No. The blank is used to indicate. That was just recent. Uh, let me. I, I think it's this one. Come here. Flag field. Adding field. Flag field. It's over here. Yeah. So it's a flag field. I was wrong. Oh, I was right first. I was wrong on my selection. The IP address assigned to a device would depend on the blunt blank it is connected. Network. Wait. Is it ARP? Protocol used to discover the hardware address of a node with a certain yeah, it's ARP address resolution. Dang it! All right, I'm worried about that one. Let's see. What the fuck? Oh, two five seven. They can't go above two five five. Crap. I didn't see that. I knew, I knew that one, I just wasn't paying attention. And the ARP is a protocol hardware addresses of a node with a certain... Well, let's go back over it. Maybe I didn't absorb that as well as I thought. So that is the... IP Oh man, it's IP datagram. I'd have been wrong a second time. I was going to choose network. That was a dumb mistake. Let's try again. <laughs> oh, what did heck say? That naughty. You have no idea how naughty I was, Hex. <laughs> they got no info on you. Alright, let's try this one again. Please select all the valid IP fields. That was stupid. And the worst part is, I can see it only ends, oh, you can't see. I've got it wrote down, it ends at 255. 257 is not an option. I knew that. That was so stupid. Take your time, Eric. That's too long. Okay, so 256, what IP address has the first two octets preserved for the network ID at the B? Flag field. And this one's IP datagram. So I missed that one and that one. Let's submit it. Wait. How did I miss this one? 
Is it network? Let me let me read it. Yeah. But but I felt like it was network to begin with. Let's try one more again. Back, try again. Gotta make sure I get it perfect. So is it network? It is network. Address assigned to a device depends on. I'm gonna write that down. Yeah. The IP address assigned Happy Wiggle, GZ100. The worst part is, dude, that last question that kept tripping me up, my first initial thought in my head was, network. I was like, no, that's too simple. They, they haven't been talking about network very much. They've been talking about how it works. Should have went with my first choice. All right, guys, I'll be right back. I got to go pee pee. My name is Sergio Latour, and I'm a network engineer at Google. When I was uh, like just like a young kid, I liked like analog tools like screwdrivers and drills, and then I liked taking things apart. And then as I got older in my teenage years, I realized I could take apart computers, and then that really interested me because when you opened it up, it was like fans, like everything. lights, like the circuitry, and I just didn't understand it. It didn't make sense to me, but if I knew if I put put it together the right way, I could actually interact with it and have fun and play my video games off of it. And that's kind of how it really started. And then by the time when I got a little older, outside of high school, I realized I could make this like a passion and then actually like really learn how this technology works. I think the favorite part is solving the problems. I really enjoy when we get to see uh, data go from one device to another Me and too, how Max. things communicate and how the customers get to enjoy it. I've gained so many different tools and skills 
and now um, I feel like a Swiss Army. Hey, you got a break before you I'm get working. Fixed. And there's so many like different experiences I can bring back to solve ch problems I face today. Early, starting off as like an entry level network technician, I had a project to upgrade a firewall for a police department. And the firewall basically is the security appliance and the entry point to the network. We, we thought it worked, it went through successfully until I got a phone call very late at night that things were broken. And what we realized that emails and you know, police uh, calls were not going through and that the upgrade failed. And at that point I realized you know, the magnitude of the things that I am working on can affect people's lives and it can cause harm and it can cause good. So it was really a good humbling experience for me when I was working on that project. I get one of those. In the most basic of terms, subnetting is the process of taking a large network. Bro, I just switched. Calm your tits. Oh, did I mark a line? Ending monologue. Oops. And splitting it up into many individual smaller subnetworks or subnets. By the end of this lesson, you'll be able to explain why subnetting is necessary and describe how subnet masks extend what's possible with just network and host IDs. You'll also be able to discuss how a technique known as CIDR allows for even more flexibility than plain subnetting. Lastly, you'll be able to apply some basic binary math techniques to better understand how all of this works. Incorrect subnetting setups are a common problem you might run into. common problem you might or will if it's common it sounds like you will I like how they worded that to make it seem like you're not gonna just be thrown into a whole bunch of I gotta recode stuff that's exactly what it sounds which just re reinforces my understanding that I have to make sure this part is learned I need to start reading over it at night. This works way to my heart, not flowers or chocolate, power tools. One of these days, Hex, I'll send you some pictures of all the tools I have. I have an assortment of power tools. I'm kind of lazy. I don't like the twisting motion. Uh, it wears out my forearms. So I invested in uh, DeWalt. I got 20 volt everything. I got sanders, saws, chainsaws, not DeWalt. 
funniest part is I keep the majority of it in my room because when the urge hits, it's normally while I'm sitting in bed watching TV. My brain just goes, oh, go fix this. Okay. <laughs> as an IT support specialist. So it's important to have a strong understanding of how this works. That's a lot. So let's dive in. Address classes give us a way to break the total global IP space into discrete networks. If you want to communicate with the IP address 9.100.100.100, core routers on the internet know that this IP belongs to the 9.0.0.0 class A network. They then route the message to the gateway router responsible for the network by looking at the network ID. A gateway router. Stop it. Okay, so it's Control S. Did it take it? Okay, I think it did. Let's try it again. Nothing showed up, so I'm assuming it worked twice. Specifically serves as the entry and exit path to a certain network. You can contrast this with core internet routers, which might only speak to other core routers. Once your packet gets to the gateway router for the 9.0.0.0 class A network, that router is now responsible for getting that data to the proper system by looking at the host ID. This all makes sense until you remember that a single class A network contains 16,777,200. Out of curiosity, 256 times 8, nope. I don't understand how that math goes. I know the top one's 2 to the 16th power, the bottom one's 2 to the 8th power. So 2 to the 16th is type B, 2 to the 8th, 2 to the 16th, 24th. I had to back up. I lost some stuff. Nice. Yeah, I think mine's a, I think mine's a class B.
Well, mine actually might be class A. I think I'd start with 7-6. I don't know. I haven't really checked into mine. 216 individual IPs. That's just way too many devices to connect to the same router. This is where subnetting comes in. With nope. subnets, you can split your large network. up into many smaller ones. These individual subnets will all have their own gateway routers serving as the ingress and egress. egress point for each subnet. <laughs> or maybe I'm preparing to be IT at Hex's job. Yeah, maybe I'm sneaky. <laughs> oh, I got issues today. <laughs> All that frustration's gone now is just stupidity. <laughs> So far, we've learned about network IDs, which are used to identify networks, and host IDs, which are used to identify individual hosts. If we want to split things up even further, and we do, we'll need to introduce a third concept, the subnet ID. You might remember that an IP address is just a 32-bit number. In a world without subnets, a certain number of these bits are used for the network ID, and a certain number of the bits are used for the host ID. In a world with subnetting, some bits that would normally comprise the host ID are actually used for the subnet ID. With all three of these IDs representable by a single single IP address, we now have a single 32-bit number that can be accurately delivered across many different networks. At the internet level, core routers only care about the network ID and use this to send the datagram along to the appropriate gateway router to that network. That gateway router then has some additional information that it can use to send the datagram along to the destination machine or the next router in the path to get there. Finally, the host ID is used by that last router to deliver the datagram to the intended recipient machine. Subnet IDs are calculated via what's known as a subnet mask. Just
<laughs> Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Just like an IP address, subnet masks are 32-bit numbers that are normally written out as four octets in decimal. The easiest way to understand how subnet masks work is to compare one to an IP address. Subnet masks are often glossed over as magic numbers. People just memorize some of the common ones without fully understanding what's going on behind the scenes. In this course, we're really trying to ensure that you leave with a well-rounded networking education. So even though subnet masks can seem tricky at first, <laughs> stick with it and you'll get the hang of it in no time. Let's work with the IP address 9.100.100.100 again. You might remember that each part of an IP address is an octet, which means that it consists of eight bits. The number nine in binary is just 1001. But since each octet needs eight bits, we need to pad it with some zeros in front. As far as an IP address is concerned, having a number nine as the first octet is actually represented as Let's backtrack. One zero zero one means that it consists of eight bits. The number nine in binary is just one zero zero one. But since each octet needs eight bits, we need to pad it with some zeros in front. As far as an IP address is concerned, having a number nine as the first octet is actually represented as zero 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 one zero zero one. Similarly, the numeral 100 as an 8 bit. Zero, one, one, zero. Number is 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. So the entire binary representation of the IP address. 9.100.100.100 is a lot of ones and zeros. A subnet mask is a binary number that has two sections. The beginning part, which is the mask itself, is a string of ones. Just zeros come after this. 
the subnet mask, which is the part of the number with all the ones, tells us what we can ignore when computing a host ID. The part with all the zeros tells us what to keep. Let's use the common subnet mask of 255.255.255.0. This would translate to 24 ones followed by eight zeros. The purpose of the mask, or the part that's all ones, The purpose of the mask, or the part that's all ones, is to tell a router what part of an IP address is the subnet ID. You You might remember that we already know how to get the network ID for an IP address. For 9.100.100.100, a class A network, we know that this is just the first octet. This leaves us with the last three octets. Let's take those remaining octets and imagine them next to the subnet mask in binary form. The numbers in the remaining octets that have a corresponding one in the subnet mask are the subnet ID. The numbers in the remaining octets that have a corresponding zero are the host ID. The size of a subnet is entirely defined by its subnet mask. So for example, with a subnet mask of 255.255.255.0, we know that only the last octet is available for host IDs, regardless of what size the network and subnet IDs are. A single 8-bit number can represent 200 I'm already that far into this. I've only got that much left. <laughs> I'm already about a third of the way through this. I might have to get more notebooks. Oh, y'all broke something and restreamed. <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, luckily, this was one that was given to me back in rehab. It finally got a chance to be put to good use. But, man, I didn't think I'd be writing this much just two weeks into it. Not even. Today is one week. No, today is day seven. I started Monday. I worked till Friday, and then I started Monday again. This is day seven. Yeah. Oh, no. TOA resets tomorrow. I got to get it done today. Dude. <laughs> I'm going to try to auto it. I got summoners running in the background. Normally I can auto up to about the high 70s, low 80s, and then a couple of them trip me up. And then once I get to the 90s, I can auto it all the way to the boss. Once I get to the boss, I can auto the boss battle. I just got to get to it. Hard. Normal, I auto all the way through. I auto all of normal and up to about the high 70, low 80s on hard before I have to start messing around. It just depends on if they throw that um, werewolf team on hard or not. 
wherever they throw it on hard depends on where I have to start manually to get past it because that werewolf team eat, eats my auto team. Pretty bad because they hit hard and they're kind of squishy. Yeah, the Jolton mixed with it's either it's either Ragdoll or Dark Yeti, but it's mixed with somebody else that also hurts you. It's all dark. Is it? No, it's not. It's not Leo. It's an all dark team, and it's got four. I think it's four werewolves and then something else, or it might be two werewolves and three something else. I can't remember. But it's the werewolf one that always screws me up. One hundred and fifty-six different numbers, or more specifically, the numbers zero through two hundred and fifty-five. This is a good time to point out that, in general, it's a problem. subnet can usually only contain two less than the total number of host IDs available. Again, using a subnet mask of 255.255.255.0, we know that the octet available for host IDs can contain the numbers 0 through 255, but 0 is generally not used, and 255 is normally reserved as a broadcast address for the subnet. This means that really only the numbers 1 through 254 are available for assignment to a host. While this total number less than 2 approach is almost always true, generally speaking, you'll refer to the number of hosts available in a subnet as the entire number. So even if it's understood that two addresses aren't available for assignment, you'd still say that 8 bits of host ID space have 256 addresses available, not 254. This is because those other IPs are still IP addresses, even if they aren't assigned directly to a node on that subnet. Now, let's look at a subnet mask that doesn't draw its boundaries at an entire octet, or 8 bits of address. The subnet mask 255.255.255.224. Oh, I'm paying attention for a second. Excuse me, that was kind of rude. My computer gives me pain some, <laughs> sometimes. Oh, wait. GZ Hex, got them both done in nine hours. That's just one little day. What? Why did it disable your GPU? Oh. Are you running onboard uh, video? Each one comes with on, well, you know, it comes with onboard video. I need to finish this video. It's time for me to eat. Four would translate to 27 one, even if they aren't assigned directly to a node on that subnet. Now, let's look at a subnet mask that doesn't draw its boundaries at an entire octet or eight bits of address. The subnet mask 255. say that that doesn't draw all of its way 56 addresses available not 254 this is because those other ips are still ip addresses even if they aren't assigned directly to a node on that subnet now let's look at a subnet mask that doesn't draw its back that doesn't draw its way boundaries at an entire octet or at an entire octet that doesn't draw its boundaries at an entire octet at an entire octet octet, octet. or 8 bits of address or 8 bits of address The subnet mask 255.255.255.224 and host IDs, which have 256 addresses available. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. 
Yeah, battery saver disables all things that's not in use, so if it doesn't deem it as needing to be used, it'll just put it to sleep. That that makes sense. My phone does the same thing since it's a gaming phone. Whenever I drop to 20% battery, it'll automatically lower my resolution from 1, 165 hertz. Let me see where I'm at. Yeah, it automatically drops it from 165 to uh, 90. It also drops my uh, GPU uh, down to 20%. So if it's on like um, overclock or uh, you know uh, the the one right below it, it'll drop it down to balanced or eco-friendly. Oh, <laughs> well, it drops all that stuff. <laughs> Available, not 254. This is because those other IPs are still IP addresses, even if they aren't assigned directly to a node on that subnet. Now, let's look at a subnet mask that doesn't draw its boundaries at an entire octet, or eight bits of address. The subnet mask 255.255.255.224 would translate to 27 ones followed by five zeros. Did you say subnet? Was that a subnet? Net. Now, let's look at a subnet mask that. Okay, two fifty five. That doesn't draw its boundaries at an entire octet or eight bits of address. The subnet mask. 255.255.255.224 would translate to 27 ones followed by five zeros. This means that we have five bits of host ID space, or a total. Total of thirty two addresses. This brings up a shorthand way of writing subnet masks. Let's say we're dealing with our old friend 9.100.100.100 with a subnet mask of 255.255.255.224. Since that subnet mask represents 27 ones followed by with Wait, our old friend 9.100.100 way of writing subnet masks. Let's say we're dealing with our old friend 9.100.100.100 with a subnet mask of 255.255.255.224. Since that subnet mask represents 27 ones followed by five zeros, a quicker way of referencing this is with the notation slash 27. The entire IP and subnet mask could be written out out as 9.100.100.100 slash 27. Neither notation is necessarily more common than the other, so it's important to understand both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, 
what it looked like. Three one hundred. Or what's that? One seven. All right, guys. It's time for me to eat. EW, if you're confused, I'm confused with you right now. <laughs> Alright, the beast is awake. Don't need a repeat of last night. Bye, Hex. Alright, I'll be right back. I'm gonna go get my food situated. And I'm gonna come back and eat it. some more of this going. Let's see where I'm hung up on TOA anyways. Oh crap. Got five arena fights. That's starting to build up. Let's see if I can auto them all. Is it that W-Y Dizid? Oh. I've just been ignoring him, bro. He's useless. He's all talk. I gave him an address. He didn't feel like it, so... I just lost that fight. Oh, I wasn't paying attention. They had a Riley. That was dumb. What do you mean you don't know what you're going to use that for? Take it to 12, bro. Anytime it rolls like that, roll it to 12. And see what the next one is. 
It looks like it could be a good rune. Dude, you missed... You only missed one. Because the initial was one low. So you really only missed a total of one. Uh, no. No, it's not either. No, keep it. Uh, that's a good speed. Flat HP. Who do I know that needs... Yeah, you, you need to keep it. It's 22 speed. I don't, I don't care who you put it on. You need to keep it. Um, that really looks like, who needs to crit and be fast? Keep it, man. Keep it. Wait until you come across a build that requires crit rate and needs to be fast. And then you can figure out what to do with the last one. Yes, I'm definitely keeping it good. I'm going to mute this mic while I eat. I could do Jamir when I get everything else sped up. Yeah, no, that could be a good one. Jamir doesn't really need crit damage, although a crit damage build is sometimes used. So yeah, no, just gym it out with the legendary HP. Try to aim for that 13% or higher. I, I think 13 is max. I'm sorry. Aim for that 13%. And then essentially you could get 23% HP with a 20, a 27 speed. If you get everything perfect. And on that accuracy and resistance, it'd work real good. Yeah. That could be a good Jameer rune. Good thinking, man. Alright. Heck yeah, man. Six to sixteen, so you got two fives. What was the other roll? Oh, I'm dropping food everywhere. With eight HP, third. Oh, that's a six and a seven. That's three percent on accuracy. No, that's still viable, man. You got attack, HP, accuracy, and 16 speed. Oh, that's surprising. World boss never gives good stuff.
Dang, that's the second arena I've lost.
hoping for fun learning. <laughs>
Hey, Jack, you still on here? How do you take down the wind, Puppet Master? This bish is killing me. I ain't never fought one like this. It's just a, a three punisher, three star punisher. Wait a minute. Ah, my barrow just procked out of everything. I just whooped her. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> sorry, buddy. I didn't mean to hurt your feelings with that one. <laughs> yeah, just just Punisher three ain't that rough. I'm keeping them aggroed, so that's good. This light freaking um occult girl is about to take me out. Yeah, I keep snoozing him, man. Well, they just took out my colonel. Shoot. This bitch just gotta go, bro. Stop hitting my colonel. Dang it, man. Yep, she beat me. I give up. I'm going at it hard hitting. I'm tired of your BS. They're super fast, so I'm going to drag. Let's go water. Molong, Woosa, Sagar. P3, just one right below G1. I am a G1. <laughs> Bro, I am G1. <laughs> Alright, I already figured out who I got to go after. This light occult girl is really just devastating me. I thought it was originally the wind puppet master, but it's not. That occult girl just keeps procking like a wild woman. I'm going to take her out. Mo Long, do your thing. Dang it. Defense break left. Boom. Got her. Now I got a healer. Shoo. Well, that's not good. I'm about to lose my Mo Long. Yeah, they're focusing him. That'll proc somebody. Good. It worked. Still not going. Shit. Took out my Mo Long. I got Sagar and Woosah left. I wish you'd quit messing with me. All right, you go for her. Take her out. No. This chick got me, dude. Dang, that was a little disappointing. I wasted a lot of good units on them. Is that a four-star base? Screw the siege then, man. If it's too rough, I'm done. I ain't got time for it. I ain't got time for a siege if it ain't gonna work. Alright. Alright. I'm gonna take my food back.
Oh, you're doing Siege. I thought you were talking about Arena RTA. No, <laughs> I'm doing Siege. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go take this back. We'll get back to learning. back jack just give me a second to get situated looks like we lost everybody else in the situation yeah thank you sir let's see my phone just reverted okay let's get back at it i think i'm gonna do this until I get to the end of subnetting, and then I think I probably should give my brain a break. Ten minutes. Oh, those are both reading. That looks like it's going to be rough. Let's see. I should definitely get brain break. Auto-corrected. X is in 125. See her. Oh. <laughs> I tried to look at chat and forgot I was doing TOA. 75 on auto. I just passed by the one that had me hemmed up. All right, let's get back to learning. You going to be free today, Jack? Okay. I'll probably still be on at 7. I got to do something after I get done streaming here. I got to get um, an account set up. And then I'm going to hop on Power World. That's what it's going to boil down to. I got to get an account set up so I can start making some money on the side. Then I'm going to hop on Power World. Binary numbers can seem intimidating at first since they look so different from decimal numbers. But as far as the basics go, the math behind counting, adding, or subtracting binary numbers is exactly the same as with decimal numbers. It's important to call out that there aren't different kinds of numbers. Numbers are universal. There are only different notations for how to reference them. Humans, most likely because most of us have 10 fingers and 10 toes, decided on using a system with 10 individual numerals used to represent all numbers. The numerals 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9 can be combined in ways to represent any whole number in existence. Because there are 10 total numerals in use in a decimal system, yeah. another way of referring to this is as base 10. Because of the constraints of how logic gates work inside of a processor, it's way easier for computers to think of things only in terms of 0 and 1. This is also known as binary or base 2. You can represent all whole numbers in binary in the same way you can in decimal. It just looks a little different. When you count in decimal, you move through all the numerals upward until you run out. Then you add a second column with a higher significance. Let's start counting at 0 until we get to 9. Once we get to 9, we basically just start over. We add a 1 to a new column, then start over at 0 in the original column. 
We repeat this process over and over in order to count all whole numbers. Counting in binary is exactly the same. It's just that you only have two numerals available. You start with zero, which is the same as zero in decimal, then you increment once. Now you have one, which is the same as one in decimal. Since we've already run out of numerals to use, it's time to add a new column. So now we have the number one zero, which is the same as two in decimal. One one is three, one zero zero is four, one zero one is five, one one zero is six, one 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 is seven. I'm gonna have to write every bit of that down. All my paper.
Oh, I see a defeat. 77. How the heck did the Jokers take me down? Well, that was kind of dumb. Let's move on. Etc. It's the exact same thing we do with decimal, just with fewer numerals at our disposal. When working with various computing technologies, you'll often run into the concept of bits, or ones and zeros. There's a pretty simple trick to figure out how many decimal numbers can be represented by a certain number of bits. If you have an 8-bit number, you can just perform the math 2 to the power of 8. This gives you 256, which lets you know. I know this already. know that an 8-bit number can represent 256 decimal numbers, or put another way, the numbers 0 through You say decibel? Another way, the numbers bit number can represent 256 decimal numbers. Or put another way, the numbers 0 through 255. A 4-bit number would be 2 to the power of 4, or 16 total numbers. A 16-bit number would be Two to the power of 16, or 65,536 numbers. In order to tie this back to what you might already know, this trick doesn't only work for binary. It works for any number system. It's just the base changes. You might remember that we can also refer to binary as base 2 and decimal as base 10. All you need to do is swap out the base for what's being raised To the number of columns. For example, let's take a base 10 number with two columns of digits. This would translate to 10 to the power of 2. 10 to the power of 2 equals 100, which is exactly how many numbers you can represent with two columns of decimal digits, or the numbers 0 through 99. Similarly, 10 to the power of 3 is 1000, which is exactly how many numbers you can represent with three columns of decimal digits, or the numbers 0 through 999. Not only is counting in different bases the same, so is simple arithmetic, like addition. In fact, binary addition is even simpler than any other base, since you only have four possible scenarios. 0 plus 0 equals 0, just like in decimal. 0 plus 1 equals 1, and 1 plus 0 equals 1. Should also look familiar. 1 plus 1 equals 1, 0 looks a little different, but should still make sense. You carry a digit to the next column once you reach... Uh. ...or the numbers 0 through 999. Not only is counting in different bases the same, so is simple arithmetic, like addition. In fact, binary addition is even simpler than any other base, since you only have four possible scenarios. 0 plus 0 
equals 0, just like in decimal. 0 plus 1 equals 1, and 1 plus 0 equals 1. Should also look familiar. 1 plus 1 equals 1, 0. Looks a little different, but should still make sense. You carry a digit to the next column once you reach 10 in doing decimal addition. You carry a digit to the next column once you reach 2 when doing binary addition. Addition is what's known as an operator, and there are many operators that computers use to make calculations. Two of the most important operators are OR and What did you say before that? Should still make sense. You carry a digit to the next column once you reach 10 in doing decimal addition. You carry a digit to the next column once you reach 2 when doing binary addition. Addition is what's known as an operator. And there are many operators that computers use to make calculations. Two of the most important operators are OR. In computer logic, a one rep represents true, and a zero represents false. The way the OR operator works is you look at each digit, and if either of them is true, zero represents false. The way the OR operator works is you look at each digit and if either of them is true, the result is true. The basic equation is x Is true, then what is true? And the result is true? And if either of them is true, the result is true. The basic equation is x. or y equals z, which could be read as if either x
is cleared 80. Ah, shoot. or y is true, then z is true. Otherwise, it's false. Therefore, 1 or 0 equals equals 1, but 0 or 0 equals 0. The operator and does what it sounds like it does. It returns true if both values are true. Therefore, 1 and 1 equals 1. But 1 and 0 equals 0. and 0 and 0 equals 0, and so on. Now, you might be wondering why we've covered all of this. I know it's not to confuse you. It's all really to help explain subnet masks a bit more. A subnet mask is a way for a I'm going to write that down. Thank you, Jack.
think I understand that by looking at it. Because on the and side, he had me write all this down. So on the and side, it says 1 and 1 equal 1. 1 times 1 is 1. 1 and 0 equals 0. 1 times 0 is 0. 0 and 0 equals 0. So it's nothing by nothing is nothing. Whereas on addition, 1 and 0 would have been a 1 if it would have been an or instead of an and. Single digits, anyways. I don't know if they would teach you to add or subtract longer binary, but for addition, you'll have to carry the one over. Yep. Okay, cool. You did. You actually did. Uh, I had. I didn't grasp that at all. I was just writing it down. So that assisted greatly. Thank you. I need to keep remembering to do this. Because the way for a computer to use and. on the same network. Computer to use AND operators to determine if an IP address exists on the same network. This means that the host ID portion is also known since it'll be anything left out. Let's use the binary representation of our favorite IP address, 9.100.100.100, and our favorite subnet mask, 255.255.255.0. Once you put one on top of the other and perform a binary AND operator on each column, you'll notice that the result is the network ID and subnet ID portion of our IP address, or 9.100.100. <laughs> the computer that just am I gonna have to write that down son of a gun IP address subnet Mask. So we got one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. See what he says after first. Just perform this operation can now compare the result with its own network ID to determine if the address is on the same network or a different one. Yeah. Nine, one hundred, one hundred, one hundred, one, 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 one. point 
bet you never thought you'd have a favorite IP address or subnet, but that's what happens in the wonderful world of basic binary math. Oh, cool. Binary numbers can seem intimidating at first, since they look so different from decimal numbers. But as far as the basics go, the math behind counting, adding, or subtracting binary numbers is uh. exactly the same as with decimal numbers. It's important to call it that there aren't different kinds of numbers. Numbers are universal. There are only different notations for how to reference them. Humans, most likely because most of us have 10 fingers and 10 toes, decided on using a system with 10 individual numerals used to represent all numbers. Did I just restart? The numerals 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Address classes were the first attempt at splitting up the global internet <laughs> IP space. Subnetting was introduced when it became clear I started consuming water at 9 o'clock this morning. That's all I got left. That's about two more good gulps for me, one for 5 o'clock and one for 6 o'clock with my meal. That address classes themselves weren't a sufficient way of keeping everything organized. But as the internet continued to grow, traditional subnetting just couldn't keep up. With traditional subnetting and the address classes, the network ID is always either 8-bit for class A networks, 16-bit for class B networks, or 24 bits for class C networks. This right means now. that there might only be 254 class A networks in existence. Oops, there was 127 class A networks in existence. Let me double check that. Because if that's the case, you should have said something earlier. Oh, it was a mistake in this one. You did say it earlier. Okay. Bruh, 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 bruh. <laughs> but it also means there are 2,097,152 potential class C networks. That's a lot of entries in a routing table. To top it all off, the sizing of these networks aren't always appropriate for the needs of most businesses. 254 hosts in a class C network is too small for many use cases, but the 65,534 hosts available for use in a class B network is often way too large. Many companies ended up with various adjoining class C networks to meet their needs. That meant that routing tables ended up with a bunch of entries for a bunch of class C networks that were all actually being routed to the same place. This is where CIDR, or Classless Interdomain Routing, comes into play. CIDR is an even more flexible approach to describing blocks of IP addresses. It expands on the concept of subnetting by using subnet masks to demarcate networks. To demarcate something means to set something off. I need to write when all that down. discussing computer networking, it expands on the concept. I spelled that wrong. Of subnetting by using subnet masks to demarcate. Eight networks. To demarcate something means to set something off. When discussing computer networking, you'll often hear the term demarcation point. I'll start doing it that way.
I'll be right back, Jack. I gotta pee again. I set this thing to auto jack. I started at 74. I'm at 86 right now. Just auto in the crap out of it. I just lost one of my twins though, but that thing's going down. To describe where one network or system ends and another one begins. In our previous model, we relied on a network ID, subnet ID, and host ID to deliver an IP datagram to the correct location. With CIDR, the network ID and subnet ID are combined into one. Did you say network and host ID? To the correct location. With CIDR, the network ID and subnet ID are combined into one. CIDR is where we get the shorthand slash notation that we discussed in the earlier video on subnetting. This slash notation is also known as CIDR notation. CIDR basically just abandons the concept of address classes entirely, allowing an address to be defined by only two individual IDs. Probably. Let's take 9.100.100.100 with a net mask of 255.255.255.0. Remember, this can also be written as 9.100.100.100 slash 24. In a world where we no longer... No, slash 27. is so this one's different so let's write that right there oops I'm not gonna write anything there I'm gonna write it here that's a different spot let's not screw that up Zero zero point one zero zero point one zero zero. That is the son of a bitch. That's what that is. Seven point one 
subnet mask is on on the bottom IP address of subnet mask. Slash. Slash two four. <laughs> oh, I got beat. Eighty seven. Dang, bro. You being hit with some snow? Yeah, man, that's what happened to me. So it's been in the same rough uh, temperature range. And then I woke up this morning and there was just snow on the ground. Slash 24. In a world where we no longer care about the address class of this IP, all we need is what the network mask tells us to determine the network ID. In this case, that would be 9.100.100. The host ID remains the same. This practice to determine the network would be 9. about the 100.100 slash 24. In a world where we no longer care about the address class of this IP, all we need is what the network mask tells us to determine the network ID. In this case, that would be 9.100.100. The host ID remains the same. This practice not only simplifies how routers and other network devices need to think about parts of an IP address, but it also allows for more arbitrary network sizes. Before, network sizes were static. Think only class A, class B, or class C. And only subnets could be of different sizes. CIDR allows for networks themselves to be differing sizes. Before this, if a company needed more addresses than a single class C could provide, they'd need an entire second class C. With CIDR, they could combine that address space into one contiguous chunk with a net mask of slash 23, or 255.255.254.0. This means that routers now only need to know one entry in their routing table to deliver traffic to these addresses instead of two. It's also important to call out that you get additional available host IDs out of this practice. Remember that you... Do I need to write that down, Jack? No, no I don't. So that's telling me the possibilities. That's telling me how, how to get to that. That's telling me the possibilities of that. I don't know this stuff. You always lose two host IDs per network. So if a slash 24 network has 2 to the 8 or 256 potential hosts, you really only have 256 minus 2 or 254 available IPs to assign. 
if you need two networks of this size, you have a total of 254 plus 254, or 508 hosts. A single slash 23 network, on the other hand, is 2 to the 9, or 512. 512 minus 2, 510 hosts. Take a second and lock that into your memory. Oh, you son of a gun. Address class land is 2 to the 9. Yeah, that's what it's sounding like. I'm going to write it down just to be on the safe side. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Good deal. That didn't make much sense if I'm if I'm being honest. Now I feel like I'm confused on this slash stuff. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. That's the amount of lines to equal it up. So that's the amount of available hosts. So if I got a whole nother line, I got a whole nother to the power of. Okay. So the, the lower the number the higher the hosts. <laughs> Big brain moment. Yeah, I learned something just then. The lower the networks, the higher the hosts. I didn't grasp that before. So the more ones, you, you, you calculate that slash by how many ones the subnet mask makes up. And then the zeros at the end of it is how many hosts you can have. So if there's 24, that means there's there's only 24, 8, 16, 24. There's another 8 missing. Yeah, oh, duh. 8 bits of host. So at 23, there's 9. So there's a whole other column. So instead of going 2 to the 8th power, you go 2 to the 9th. That made sense. That's going to be hella hard to multiply. <laughs> well, no, it won't. I just got to go times 2 until I reach that number. Okay. Oh, my TOA stuck. Give me one second, Jack. Let's knock out this spot I'm stuck on real quick. Die. Oh, you're frozen. Brain do go zoom. <laughs> Froze. Let's take you out. Come on now. Die. Good deal. Take him out. Use the twins to take that guy out. I think as soon as I beat uh, Tyrone, I'll be alright. 
Tyrone's always a problem. Him and his big freezing energy. Got three of them right here. So one Tyrone didn't get stunned. There we go. All three stunned. This should be all I need to finish. Kill Tyrone. Go down. Kill Tyrone. Alright. <laughs> it's awesome when my water homunculus just eats stuff. Alright. Let that auto while I finish up this video. Or 512. 512 minus 2, 510 hosts. Take a second and lock that into your memory. Okay, I did. Subnetting, is that reading or a test? Practice quiz, what, what? Does the subnet have three or four octics? It has, it has four. Yeah, it has four. Victory. I think it's the first. No, it's the second. It's the last two. How many possible host IDs do you always lose per network? Let's check that one. If your IP address is and your subnet mask is, what part of the subnet mask represents the subnet ID? I don't think I understood that. Oh no.
I wrote it down, but I think I wrote it down wrong. Defeated. Quit dying, you piece of shit. This is the subnet ID. say the first two. Yes. Time to correct it. Thank you, buddy. That one I kind of understood. Well, I don't think the way that they wanted me to understand it, but I understood it in my own way. That one tripped me up. I wrote it down wrong. Oops. I wonder if I should have wrote that down. Oh, I wrote that down really wrong. Move on. 4.30, do we have enough time to move on? I should be having somebody coming very soon. Let's watch this. If something is stumping you or you feel stuck at a certain aspect, there's always someone else who's going through the same thing. Anytime I started to feel overwhelmed by information or like I just wasn't getting it, I wasted so much time being unsure of myself that I should have just listened to my friends and family when they said, just do it, you can do it. One of the greatest uh, things that helped me to get back motivated is the accessibility of the course on my phone. I was just able to go into the app and listen to a few videos because I can learn on the go. Having a network of people that motivates you, it's so fundamental. You know, even if it's a friend or if it's a family member, that you can get from the beginning and it can be there for you on your corner like a coach. And don't be afraid to ask for help, whether it be from your peers, from your coaches, friends, family. There's always someone who knows more and you can learn from them. Hey, just as a heads up, that's a good life uh, lesson. Uh, never, never think you're uh, great at anything. Always assume that's... Text leftovers and I. I don't think I understand that. For you? <laughs> Appreciate it, brother. But yeah, that that's uh Oh yeah. No, I understood that now. <laughs> yeah, you guys have been helping me out a lot. But that whole thing you just said, uh there's always somebody out there that probably is going through the same thing you're going through and they have more knowledge. I always take that into life.
Uh, always assume that no matter how good you are at something, there's somebody out there better than you. And always strive to be better than them. Ooh, I don't know if I want to do all this. That'll put me till 6 o'clock. I feel my brain's going to get fried. Especially with that basic routing concepts. Shoo. Yeah, I think I'm going to call this quits for the day. I'll pick back up tomorrow. Knock out routing. Already knocked out three. That was pretty short. That was pretty short. That was even shorter. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, six. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's eight in this one too, which means it'd take me an hour and a half. I wouldn't be done until six. Yeah, I'm gonna get off. Uh, I'm gonna. I got something I gotta take care of real quick. Then I'm gonna hop on some Power World. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna soak it all in. But I got something I'm gonna check out or take care of real quick. Then I'm gonna hop on some Power World. I look forward to seeing you later, Jack. Uh, anybody else in here? Thank you for joining me. Um, I look forward to seeing you again tomorrow for some more learning. Uh, I'm also gonna change my Twitch schedule. I need to do that right now before I forget. say anything. Yeah, yeah, it still says Power World. I gotta remember how I changed that. I go to creator dashboard, right? Content, clips, community, activities, role managers, follow list, settings, stream, channel. Schedule. Found it. All right. I'm going to alter that one from 10 a.m. to 8. I'd like to get started going at 8. Monday workout. Save. Power World, let's edit that. Title. Learning. IT. Category. Not Power World. Education. I'm going to adjust that to 1 p.m. I'm not sure. Save changes. Go eight. Morning workout. Chest with shoulders. Save. Edit Power World. Education. Change that to one. Not sure. Save changes. Tuesday. Eight a.m. Morning workout. I got whooped on 90, Jack. 8 a.m. Let's change Power World to Learning IT. Education. 1 p.m. 
save changes. Jesus, it's only Wednesday. Thursday, 8 a.m. morning workout. Shoulders with Oops. my phone direct chest. 8 a.m. save changes. Battle world Thursday. Changes every Friday. No longer going to be Power World. Learning IT. Education. Change it from one to save changes. Saturday. Let's delete that. Let's delete Sunday. Oh, yeah, Dark Sif. It's because I'm autoing it. I'm not paying attention. Yeah, my Lauren's already almost dead. Let's take him out. Dots. Let's heal Lauren. Go down. Got it set up on auto now. Let's see if he still takes me down. Oh yeah, he's a goner now. Just me and you, bro. Yeah, it's going to take him down. This is going to take a minute. It's just going to take a minute. All right, Jack. Well, I'm going to get off here. Can't tussle with the muscle. <laughs> that team was built specifically for TOA. <laughs> All right, brother, I'm going to get off here. Uh, I'm going to play some Power World now. Uh, no, I'm not. I'm going to do some setting up on some things. Then I'm going to play some Power World. I look forward to seeing you around, brother. Have fun, everybody else that viewed this. I'll be back on tomorrow, same time, to uh, be learning some more. Hopefully, we'll knock out this course and move towards our next one and get this done in a month. Yeah, I think I can get it done in another month. All right, have fun, everybody.